Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast and to a new episode of the series which looked at travelers, diplomats, merchants of the 16th century Mediterranean, where so far we've covered a lot of accounts looking at 16th century Cyprus before the Ottoman conquest of what was one of the most prized Venetian possessions in the eastern Mediterranean. Today I will want to speak about the ending of Paolo Parota's account, which I've covered as well in the third and fourth episodes of the podcast way back in, I believe it was 2017, which looked at the fall of not just Nicosia but also Famagusta, the last stronghold of Venetian Cyprus, what happened with the garrison there and most notably the gruesome ending of Marcantonio Bragadin. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you to please hit that subscribe button. It really does help the channel a lot to make sure you never miss any new material from the podcast. And let us resume. Paolo Parota's account is one of the most complete and detailed one from Excepta Cipria as it looks at context, pretext and causality. It looks at the fall of Nicosia, what preceded that and what succeeded that with the last step, which was Famagusta. We get more about the author of this account Paolo Parota was born in Venice in 1540 and entered public life on the staff of an embassy sent by the Republic in 1562 to Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian II and eventually filled all the chief offices of state, short that of Doge. As historiographer of the Republic, he basically made a compilation of uh, sources and documents which was begun by Pietro Bembo and continued by Luigi Contarini and brought them all the way to the date of March 1573. Uh, his account of the siege of Nicosia, uh, which is Storia della Guerra di Cipro, is extremely important. We have the English translation by Henry Carey and that is available on online. Paolo Parota died in 1598, more than two decades after the Ottoman conquest of Cyprus, and his history was published by his sons in 1605. As I've said before, it is one of the best accounts of what happened during the um, Ottoman-Venetian War between 1570 and 1573. So, towards the end of this very lengthy account, I think it's over 20 pages long, um, because I've spoken at length throughout many of the series about what happened in Nicosia and what happened in uh, Famagusta and what happened with Bragadino as well, uh, I want this episode to kind of be sort of a sad aftermath of the extent of Venetian neglect of uh, Cyprus. And also, I want to look at a few accounts right immediately after the Ottoman conquest until the end of the 16th century to kind of compare and contrast to what uh, was before and after uh, what I would say is one of the most important events in the 16th century Mediterranean, certainly in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. So I'll just start with the paragraph which goes like, quote, but it is a tearful story we have to tell of Bragadino. What forms of martyrdom these cruelest, vilest of men caused him to suffer. After insults and wild mockery, he was led into the square of Amagusta and there bound to the stones of the pillory and flayed alive, while Mustafa stood to the end of, on a terrace of the palace to feast his eyes and bestial heart on the weird and cruel sight. Incredible was the courage which this bravest of heroes showed in all his terrible torments, a courage which ought to preserve and grace his memory throughout the ages. But the fury of Mustafa's anger was not yet exhausted, and he ordered that the skin should be filled with straw and set on a cow. In bitter mockery, the red umbrella under which the living Bragadino had ridden to the camp was held over it. It was carried throughout the city, and finally, on his departure, it was hung on the yard of a galley, that he might parade his infamous trophy before the inhabitants of the coast towns which he passed. The reason which moved Mustafa to this fiendish cruelty is not clear. Some said that as the soldiers had missed the booty promised to them from the sack of the city, Famagusta being, he wished by the punishment of a few to avenge the deaths of the many men he had lost in that siege, and give some kind of satisfaction to his army. Others again, that irritated by the length and obstinacy of the defense and by the loss of certain friends very dear to him, he had already sworn to take some terrible vengeance. But there were yet some who believed that in 
the spirit of Mustafa, a man so given to anger that once moved, he was went to grow furious and actually mad, was excited to frenzy and scorn on seeing Bragadino and his companions come to his pavilion with so large an armed escort and so richly clothed, as though they were rather victors than vanquished. This seems but a trifling excuse for so savage a crime. But the time which he allowed to pass between the first sentence and the latter and more cruel tortures lends it some probability. It was mere madness which stirred him to rage even against the dead. He entered the Episcopal Church of St. Niccolo, caused the graves to be opened and the bones scattered. He destroyed the altars and the images of the saints and committed other bestial and cruel acts for which he was much blamed even by his own people. The city, Famagusta, thus was acquired. Order was taken at once carefully to clear the ditches of the ruins of the walls, to raise all the forts and fill all the trenches outside, and to repair all that had been destroyed within. Thus, the fortress was soon restored to its original condition and made even more secure and defensible than it had been before. Mustafa Pasha put the Bay of Rhodes in charge of the city and on the 24th of September left Cyprus, returning victorious and triumphant to Constantinople, where he was received with high honors and universal joy. Yet the victory had cost the Turks dear, for they had lost, so report said, more than 50,000 men, and among them many commanders of high rank and their best warriors. End of quote. The fall of Famagusta resulted into the collapse of Venetian Cyprus. The Ottomans had rebuilt many of the fortresses in Nicosia and of Famagusta, and it seemed almost impossible that the Venetians could try and reattempt to take uh, Cyprus. It did not happen af in the aftermath of Lepanto. It would not happen afterwards. More, Even more so in the next century, we would see the War of Candia, the War of uh, Venetian Crete, which would last uh, many, many years. This was the conclusion of the Ottoman-Venetian War in Cyprus, one that would change the geopolitical landscape in the Eastern Mediterranean and the balance of power, of course, as well. In the next couple of episodes, as I've said before, I'd like to look at other accounts um, after this date of 1573, hopefully in the at the end of the 1500s and maybe at the beginning of uh, the 1600s. Thank you for listening to this brief episode of the Wanderers History Podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, all the best.